On July 29th, Errol Spence and Bud Crawford will put their undefeated records on the lines. Our partner is DraftKings Sportsbook edition of a can't-miss offer for this fight of the year. New customers can bet just $5 and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Use promo code SMOKE when you sign up with the DraftKings app. Stack, who you going with right now? You know, Crawford is the slight favorite. Yes, this is a 50-50 fight. Uh, both fighters are bringing something different to the fight, and both are at the top of the division. But me being from Texas, I'm going with the big fish. I'm loyal, and, uh, you know, hey, we're going to get him out of here. You heard Stack. Take your pick on over to DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers use the promo code SMOKE. Throw down just $5 and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. If sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry. You can still join in on all the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use the promo code SMOKE. Bet $5 on any wager and get up to $150 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code SMOKE, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Welcome back. All the smoke. Las Vegas Summer League 2023 coming to you from the Blue Wire studio Yo. here at the Wynn Hotel. You And we got one of the homies here. <laughs> like we met T. Lou back in the late 90s when you first came from Mexico, Missouri out to L.A. <laughs> yeah. Welcome yeah. to the show, man. T. Thank Lou. You. No, I appreciate it. I'm, fin uh, I'm finally made it, man. Yeah, finally we've been trying to get here. you on here for a minute. Yeah, and I wasn't big time, y'all. I just really had busy. Stuff. Yeah, you yeah, was yeah, big yeah, time. Busy man. <laughs> nah, I'll talk about big time. Nah, he's hey, busy, nah. a busy big timer, and we got the man Doodles in the building, the legend. Yeah. His partner in crime, man. Uh, man, let's get to it. Uh, Eleven year pro, one of the smartest players in the game, transitioned into a coach. Um, what's life like as a coach? What's the day to day? I mean, obviously. Blessed to play double digit years in the league, but someone just asked me the other day, would you ever coach in the NBA? I'm just like, that's a whole nother monster. Talk yeah. to us about that monster. I mean, it's, it's a grind. I mean, you know, um, being a you know a lower level player in the NBA, you always had a grind to get my next contract, get to the next season, get to the next year. But this is a totally different grind. Like, you know, as a player, you know, you win a game, you can go out and celebrate and kick it, you know, hit a game win or whatever. But as a coach, you go on to the next. It never stops, you know, and so um, it's a lot of work, you know, it's a lot of work, uh, a lot of pressure. You know, you have good teams and you um, are supposed to win a championship or you're supposed to be a contender. Um, it's a lot of work. And so uh, when I first took the job with the Clippers, you know, Mr. Bomber and, and, La and Lawrence Frank was like, you know, like, what do you do? Like, what's your, your get away from the game? I said, like, when I'm in the season, I don't get away. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm diving all the way in. And so there's like, you know, you got to have something you can have a release. And so. Um, I'm trying to get better with that because I don't play golf. I don't do none of that stuff. So it's just a grind. It's it's a big difference. And so um, I tell all guys, like, if you made enough, enough money in the league, you probably don't want to coach. Don't but if you, <laughs> yeah, if you made the kind of money I made, then you want to coach for sure. But it's like, it's it's our lifestyle. It's all, all right. we know. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and so giving back to the younger guys, um, you know, really, it's really a blessing. So, yeah. you know, I enjoy it. That's a, I mean, I, that's a good question because you don't smoke, don't drink, never have or nothing. So it's like, how do you? Unwind and like just you know what I'm saying just like get away from it because it's hard to get yeah. away from it when you're a head coach. I think it's tough. I think when I first you know took over Stack in uh, when I was 38 years old and one of the youngest coaches in the league and um count how, how it transpired you know it really was it really wasn't a good look you know Coach Blatt you know we was number one in the East when he got fired we went to the finals the year before and um taking over midway through the season it was tough and so you know Kyrie K Love Tristan LeBron they all have my back Jr mm -hmm. Shump but you know, moving over one seat. It's like, you don't, difference. you know, I think I can do it. I want to do it, but, you know, I, I haven't had that experience. And so, um, so I said, man, I got to come. I got to grind. Like, it can't be no days off. You know, mm -hmm. LeBron, he knows everything. Every play call another team makes, everything, everything we do. So I got to be on top of my stuff. And so I just dove right into it. I'm grinding. I'm going to make mistakes. But Bron, Caleb, like I said, and Kyrie, and it was behind me 100%. So I made a lot of mistakes along the way, but it made me better. And it kept me on my toes and it kept me grinding. You're one of the most, I don't know if it matters, but it's, it's it's always good to be like, but you're one of the most liked coaches. You've been known as a player coach. To me, one of the best in-game adjusting coaches in the game. What do you feel some of the more important skills to succeeding in a position such as yours are? 
Uh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. It just um, you're a player's coach until you tell a player no. <laughs> and then they're mad. They talk oh, stuff about you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or they don't get their shots or they don't get their minutes. You know nah. what I'm saying? But you know, the biggest thing is like being a player coach is like, you know, I understand the league. And so people go, oh, man, they go out. Or they, so what? Like, front office people go out too. Y'all mm -hmm. go out and have wine and right. y'all mm -hmm. kick it. So right. why can't the other guys do it? So the biggest thing about being a player coach is like, y'all get in late. Hey, man, can we move practice back from 11 to 2? Yeah, cool. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm a... I'm a Long as we you've been there. Yeah, because I've been there. I understand what work. it takes. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So um, that's one of the biggest things as far as player coach. I think um, as far as just coaching in general, I think just, you know, doing it for the black coaches. And now we, I think we have 16 or 17 black head coaches mm -hmm. in the NBA. Half the league. Yeah, when I got there, it was only, I think, three. Mm -hmm. You know, and so just trying to be um, a vehicle between the black coaches and just, just the league and just trying to like, okay, we can do this. And so... As much as I grind, I keep grinding, getting better and better. They're gonna allow younger coaches and young black coaches to have a chance, and yeah, so definitely. that's kind of like that's my that's what I'm supposed to do. That's dope. It, it, and for me, it's nothing against coaches who haven't played the game, but for me, it's just something special about having a guy like you on the sideline because they can players can come out the game, and you can see something that you have experienced yourself in the game that they don't see. And you can and you can coordinate that to your players, and they can take that back to the game to help y'all win the game. Right. If a if a coach has never played the game or never been in those situations with guys, that's a plus that you have. You know, so that's that's why I say having you, I can see why you are one of the best in game decision making coaches because you've been in there on the court as well. Yeah, I mean that helps with my adjustments because yeah. I've been through it. Right. You know, I played and I've seen different situations, um, but you can't be afraid to do it. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of coaches might have a lot, a lot of adjustments, but. They're worried about what the media is going to say with the guy. Like, no, yeah, yeah. Say. So, like, mm -hmm. if you work on it and we do this every single day, like, I don't care what the outside thinks. Like, my players know we work on this every single day. Mm -hmm. And this is what we do. And so, you know, when you want to make adjustments, you got to be ready to do it, like, right now. You can't wait till after the game. Oh, uh, you know, lost the game. Yeah, yeah, the game's over. You're in the playoffs. <laughs> Man, that's, that's a big, you know what I'm saying? So, you got to do it now. And mm -hmm. so, I'm always trying to think three steps ahead. Like, when I'm watching film, getting ready for the game, I want to make sure this is my first, second, third adjustment. They beat me with this. I want to be prepared to do this. And so mm -hmm. I'm always ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. uh, got an opportunity to come bench side with Doc in Boston and then uh, with the Clippers uh, is where I had you the first time. And I seen, obviously knowing you before, but seeing your mind start to work. I never got a chance to play with you. Uh, so seeing your mind work, because I don't even know if you were the second or third assistant, but I would, like, you were a voice that we still listen to and respected, even though you weren't the head coach. Um, speak to the importance that Doc has kind of had in your coaching Shit. life. Yeah, everything. You know, um, in 2003, when I played for him in Orlando, he's like, when you're done playing, you can come coach with me. And I'm like, Shit, I ain't, I ain't gonna never coach. Like, I'm, I'm never doing this. But like in 2009, I was done playing. And um, I was like, what else am I gonna do? All I know is basketball. So I gave Doc a call. Um, and he's like, I'll call you back in a day or two. And I'm like, yeah, right. You know, but he called back the next day, had a job for me, him and Danny Ainge. So I give him credit for that. And then just, you know, the first year in Boston, he just kind of like let me get the player out of me, like see if you like it, see if you enjoy it. And then the second year, I got more responsibility doing some of the offense and stuff. And then he appointed me to KG and Rondo, the two of the craziest, <laughs> craziest guys you can kind of, you know, be appointed to. But it helped me as a coach because I was able to tell those guys the truth. And I think – um, you know, as players, you know, you might you might cuss me out, you might be mad, but if I you tell you the hear truth, the truth. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, but if you hear the truth, like if you're real it. with yourself, you can mm -hmm. you can understand that you can respect that. Mm -hmm. And so um that right there helped me and allowed me to like if I can tell KG and Ronald the truth, I can tell anybody the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's kind of like how I coach and Doc gave me that platform to do that and it got me better and better and better. And he's one of the best, you know, ATO guys, you know, you know, adjustment guys as well, which he don't get a lot of credit for, you know. And so I learned a lot from him. You know, I learned a lot from a lot of coaches I played for. Phil Jackson. I learned a lot from Scott Skiles. You know, Stan Van Gundy, Jeff Van Gundy, Doug Collins. And so you kind of take pieces from every coach of how you want to do it and how you don't want to do it. And everybody have their own philosophy. So, you know, when people talk about, oh, I can't believe he did, the coach did that. Well, if he works on that every single day in practice, how are you going to question what he did? Like, mm -hmm. that's his philosophy, you know? And so it's not yours. If you don't work on it every single day, like, you can't go – like on TV, oh, I can't believe he did that. That was a poor adjustment. Or he did so like no, these players, these coaches work on this every single day. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's hard to kind of question. Me as a coach now seeing it, it's hard to question what a guy does, especially if that's what he believes in. Right. Yeah. I've asked 
former teammates of that Clipper team, I've asked Doc this. I felt like we had one of the most talented rosters in the NBA for a couple years with those Clipper teams, yeah. but never materialized into nothing. As a truth teller that you are, what did you see our issues being, and why did you feel like we couldn't get over the hump? Um, I think the biggest thing um, for me it was like the CP and Blake, like two great players, and it remind me a lot of like Kobe and Shaq, like two great players that – really didn't get along as best they could. Like, and you always had to step in and like, man, no, we're going to do it mm-hmm. like this. And they would get on board. Mm-hmm. But like, they were too talented. Like, <sighs> once you gifted, once you're a max player, like, like they like, who, whose team is it? Who cares? It's Steve Bomber's team or Donald Sterling's <laughs> yeah, team. Exactly. Yeah, like, yeah, like, right. y'all going to make the most money you can make. You max mm-hmm. players. Mm-hmm. Like, you get all the attention. Everybody in LA loves y'all. They know who you are. So let's just come together and let's win. And so, and they, they were young, you know, young at the time. And so, I bet they look back on it right now, Blake like, and CP. If they look back on it now, they're like, you know what? We could have, yeah, it was special. Very special. Two talented players, two great players. And um, that was the biggest thing. When your two best players don't really get along and, mm-hmm. you know, take that next step together, it's kind of hard, you know? That had to be the problem because the supporting cast was there. Yeah, yeah. The coaching I mean, was there, the supporting <laughs> cast was there. Yeah. And, and me, even like I said, CP and Blake, what they did for that franchise was, was huge. Yeah, yeah it was yeah, amazing. And so, like, just getting on board with each other, like you said, and taking that next step, like, okay, you know what? Together. Yeah, together. We're going to win a championship because, like I said, the supporting cast was great. And then our two best players, they were they were great, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that was the biggest thing for me. Because we showed flashes, like, yo, there ain't nobody in the world that can Never, fuck with us. Yeah, it was crazy. Bullshit. Uh, recently invested uh, millions of dollars into your hometown, Mexico, Missouri. What are you trying to build over there? What you got going on? Um, what's well, called um, Cradle to Career. And um, just giving our, our young kids in Mexico an outlet and a vehicle to try to better themselves. And so growing up in Mexico, it's, it's 11,000 people. You know, So when you play in, the, in an arena, it's two times more people in the stands right. than it is in my hometown. hometown. But it's, when I grew up, it was always something going on. You know, we, We're playing baseball outside. We're playing football. We're playing basketball. And now these young kids don't get a chance to see a lot of growth like they just you know nobody's in the park playing basketball nobody's doing anything so they don't really have no one to look up to except when like you know when i get a chance to come home two or three times out of you know out of the year which is not enough it's clearly not enough and so um just talking to the kids and just talking to the um what they call themselves um because they said they don't want to be called older but the knowledge of, of mexico missouri you know the the older crowd, they um just talk about things that we need and things that we can do to try to help our kids. And so, you know, we're putting in a tutorial program. Um, the biggest thing in Mexico, which I didn't know, is the transportation piece of it. Like kids be able to get to and from places, you know, the transportation part. And then, you know, your mother, they're working two or three jobs. Now they can't take the kids there. They can't be there with the kids at different functions. So um, just trying to put a lot of things in place. We're putting in a studio. We're putting in a podcast center. We're putting in a tutorial program with computers and after school program and barbershop where kids can go and learn how to cut hair. So just trades. all yeah, different all the different trades that kids can learn to better themselves and then hopefully be able to graduate and move on and leave Mexico and, you know, do better things. And so that's my that's my biggest thing. And um Steve Bomber's been great. You know, Steve Bomber's been great in, as far as, you know, moving this charge along. Like he's like, you know, I told him what my vision was. And from day one, he's been great, and he's been on board, and um, he's helped me out a lot. That's beautiful. You mentioned on the pivot, you missed seven funerals in the past year, but felt like didn't feel comfortable enough leaving to go mourn because the team wasn't doing well. Um, obviously, that speaks to the grind, but have you had time to kind of step away and spend time with family and and and, and kind of grieve the way you need yeah, to Yeah, it's been great. You know, I had a chance to go home twice in the last, you know, month and a half. Went home for Mother's Day. Um, then my mom came out here. Then I went back for my 4th of July um, um, weekend, which I do every year. And so just having a chance to be with my family, be around them. And um, I know it was tough on my grandma. You know, it was tough for her, especially getting older and, you know, seeing a lot of loved ones, you know, lost. And so, um, you know, if I could do it all over again, I probably would take, you know, one or two trips to, to be home, be with my family because – like I said, we lost some important people. When you lose five games in a row. It's hard, um, especially in L.A. too. It's yeah, different. It's yeah. different than a different city. Then oh, Let me bounce. I'm in Indiana. Let me go home yeah. real quick. Like L.A. The travel, market, they're on you. Yeah. And the travel to get to Mexico, Missouri, yeah. you got to fly into St. Louis. Then you got an hour and a half drive then to St. Louis to Mexico. Then you got to over mm-hmm. some area. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's just, it. no, it's just a lot, you know. But like I said, um, losing five games in a row, like I didn't want to leave our team. Like, yeah. oh, it's easy to like, you know, give in, like, okay, take the easy way out. And I'm like, man, you know what? 
I'm going to stick it out. We're going to ride it out. Mm. And I'm going to show you I'm here. Like, right. I'm here for the long haul. And our guys can respect that. All three of your seasons with the Clippers ended with, ended with one or both of Kawhi Paul, one of them out. How has it been dealing with that? You know, it's been tough. You know, it's been frustrating, you know, especially as a coach. I think as our as fans, as the Clipper fans, as an organization, because you know, we feel like we have the potential to win a championship. We have all the pieces, all the right pieces, and we have two great stars. Like PJ and Kawhi are two of the, the best stars I've ever been around as far both as ways. Yeah, both ways, two way players, but not a headache. Like right. you can go to them, like they're not looking for media, they're not looking for attention. Like mm -hmm. you can go to those guys and ask them to do anything and they'll do it. And it's just unfortunate because, you know, everybody here the low management and they kind of give those guys a hard time. But at the end of the day, like, you think they don't want to play in the playoffs? Like, those, right. these are real significant injuries, you know. And so, um, you know, you try to manage guys to get to that point. When we get to the playoffs, we can finish the season. And it just, you know, it just hasn't been that way. And so it's not a thing where they're sitting out a low management in the playoffs. Like, that's, that's the dumbest shit I ever heard, you know. But this is what people don't understand. It's not Kawhi and Paul making these decisions. Right. It's the the the, uh, the staff, the, yeah, uh, the training staff. staff. Yeah. yeah, the medical staff. And, and it's smart because when you go through the injuries they've been through over the course of their career, we got to do the right thing to try to be healthy going into the playoffs. It's your investment. It's, yeah, it's our investment. You know, and so you got to be smart about it, you know. But one thing I do, you know, one thing I told Kawhi and PG this summer, like, we do got to approach the regular season in a different way. Like, we got to be, you know, approach the regular season, like, let's be serious about it. Let's not mm -hmm. wait to the playoffs. Yeah, or matter. Yeah, because it matters. Like, who you get mm -hmm. matched up with, have a home mm -hmm. court advantage. Yeah not fighting the last 10 games of the season so we won't be in the play-in. Yeah. You know, so now you can get rest. Yeah. You know, now, you can, now you can get yourself together mm -hmm. and be ready for the playoffs. And so they both understood that as well. And I know that's got to be frustrating for you because Kawhi will sit out, then he'll come in the playoffs and average 35 and lock up. And you're like, okay. Yeah, back. yeah. And then he has to sit because the knee starts acting up. So I just know as a competitor and you and a fan of the game, that's hard to see as a head coach. Yeah, it's tough because like, if it wasn't good enough, then you're like, oh, you know, it is what it is. You'll but I think we're good enough. Nah, you know, sure. I think we're good enough. And so um, with the coaching staff that I have in place, with our players, like you said, the role players, the organization's done a great job of putting this together. And, like, I just want to see it just yeah. one time. <laughs> just let through. me see it one time. See it and then we can go from there, and then you can kind of evaluate where we're at. Yep. I'm one. I'm a guy who... I know him, but he don't know him like that. But I'll die for Russ. I'm, <laughs> so I'm, I don't even know I'm, him, but I'm I love him. Like in front that. of a train, yeah. For yeah. some reason, dog, I just you know what I'm saying the way he played the game, the way he approached it every night. Like I just you know what I'm saying he's somebody that I wish I could have been his teammate. Tell me your opinion of Russ. How you feel about Russ? I love Russ. I know you from do. day one. From day one, you know, and when you get a guy like that, that. Plays hard every single night and gives you everything every single night, and he plays every, every night. Single night. <laughs> and he plays the same <laughs> way every. <laughs> so like teams that acquire him or teams that like you know what you're getting. Yeah. Like you know, what I'm saying he's a tough dude, tough minded. You know, and I mean what he did for our season, him and Plumley and Bones and Eric Gordon. But what Russ and those guys did coming in for the last 20 games of the season, um, he saved us. Yeah. You know, PG goes down and he went to another level. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. Um, I love him. You know what I'm saying? We got a great relationship. I can be real with him. He can be real with me. Yeah. And um, all he wants is the truth. Like, if you tell him the truth and say, Russ, it's what we're going to do. It's how we're going to use you. It could be this or that. He's good he with it. it. Yeah, he respects it. You know, and so um, sometimes you got to save him from himself because he gets, you know, he gets fired up. Oh, you gets, know, you know what I'm saying? But, yeah. but so what? Do you. You know, yeah. if you're doing too much, I'll let you know. But be who you are. And I got, it's my job as a coach to try to make you fit into this this puzzle, you know, mm -hmm. as far as our team, but do be who you are and then give me five, 10 games and I can put you in place to be successful. And he was great, man. I loved, I think you and Darvin Ham extended his career from a standpoint of, I feel like, and, and Jack talked about this earlier in the interview, player coaches who've been there and done that. And I think that he was more susceptible. I think it started with Darvin. It might have took a little while to accept the role with the Lakers, and he accepted it and flourished. And then, like you said, when he came over, you explained what he needed, and he accepted the role and flourished. And there's, to me, there's a knock on who people think he is, right. not who he necessarily is. But I really think you guys have mentally helped him grab another five years in this game. Yeah, for sure. And the athleticism is still there, the IQ, the passing. Like, I mean, he was great, man. Like I said, and when, he, when we um, found out we only had, like, 3.8 to pay him, whatever. I'm like, man, it's no way we're going to get him back. Like, you know, but he's like, I want to win. I want to be in the city I'm from. I want to win. Clippers never won before, and I love what we're doing here. And so he came back. And so, you know, a guy like that could have went out and got 15 yeah. minutes somewhere else, you know, yeah. come back for the 3.8. Uh, it just tells you who he is, and he wants to win. So I really appreciated that. You rather a guy have that motor 
and pull him back a Hell little yeah. bit. You have to put the motor in him because he don't have it you at all. You can't do that. You know what I'm saying? You can't put a motor in somebody. That's why I respect him so much. Though. Yeah, no. Every, every day. Practice. Not, not just games. Practice. Like, every day. He go, he's going hard every single day. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't know where he gets like. the energy from. 15 years in the league, but every day, Jack, no lie. Practice mm -hmm. every day. And that's what kind of helped us get over the hump, too, because yeah. when he got there, we had, like, six good practices where we can actually go hard and, like, kind of teach the, the new guys what we were doing. But but actually, you know, learning some good habits going into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. I mean, those six practices, this he was a monster. <laughs> a monster. You know, and so he allowed us to do that every single not no, nah, come on, PG. Come on, Wild. Let's, let's, let's go. <laughs> you know, and that made yeah. it easier on me. You know yep. what I'm saying? So yep. it was great, man. That's what's up. Shout out Russ, man. 2024, you're moving into a new home. You ready for that? New mm -hmm. arena. How you feeling? What does that symbolize? Um, it symbolized growth. Yeah. Um, symbolizes growth for the Clipper organization. And I remember when Mr. Bomber came in, that's what he said. I want to build an arena. I want to have our our fans, you know, our place, our home. And so the vision came true and he was he was serious about it and he got it done. But it it definitely symbolizes growth for the Clippers organization. I think for the Clippers fans and for the city of LA. You know, I know it's the Lakers fans, Clippers fans, and but once you, if we're not playing each other, you should cheer for each. You should cheer for each team because it's home. You know what mm -hmm. I mean, like. And so I think we're getting around. We're coming around to that. Um, Bob, Mr. Bomber doing a lot of great things in the community. Um, in Inglewood, putting I think he said he was, was it hundred million or three hundred million in the in the in the city of Inglewood. Mm -hmm. You know, so just a de it. yeah developing that. You know, so that project and so so just trying to be there for the people, man. The people of L.A., the city of L.A. And I just think it's you know it symbolizes growth. Yeah, he he's super excited. He's so he's so excited. He um motivated about the, the number of shitters yeah. that that he gonna have in the arena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he excited yeah. about that. More, Cause he, his whole thing, he wants more toilets, so now people's not waiting in line, they you're missing lie. the game. Yeah. He, he wants everybody to be in their seats. Yeah. He catering to him. That's yeah. dope. That's Business. Dope. How, how has it been working with him and any funny stories? Cause I see he he be turned up, look like he on a Red Bull every day. It's been great because like he's taught me more about the business side. Yeah. You know, and um and people don't get that game yeah, up. Yeah, they don't get that game up and learning more about the business side. You know, I asked him a lot of questions about him coming up in Microsoft and kind of how he got started. But um the biggest thing I would say, man, is just um him and helping with this project for Mexico, Missouri. Yeah. And so um I told him when he said he would come back home with me, he wanted to see like Mexico and and go forward with it. I, we talked about it a few times during the season. And so I said, I'm not going to worry him and just yeah, ask. Okay. He called me three times. When we going to Mexico? When we mm. going to Mexico? Picked me up on his private plane. We flew into Jefferson City, Missouri. He went down to Mexico, saw the landscape, had a vision, um, put that vision you know, on paper. Then we started working with PRI, um, Dream and Her Group, and then um, Jenny Goldstock, who's helping me on my side. And so kind of put this whole group together and... Um, he donated a lot of money to the city, and then we just kind of went on from there. But he's taught me a lot, man. That's beautiful, man. Because yeah. have to have to in the NBA, I play for so many teams. Some of the teams I don't even know the owner. Right? Yeah, but he's but he's genuine. Yeah, it's not it's like real. he's treating you as like like it's like family, and it's real. It's not like yeah. I've been around a lot of owners, a lot of different people, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's not it's not bullshit. It's it's yeah. it's, it's real. We and got so, him that first year after Sterling yeah. got fired, and and you had only had one year, but you could feel it. Like you yeah. said, it's genuine. It's not because of the name on the back of your jersey. Like he cares about you as a person, which right. is which is different. So that's yeah. dope. Uh, born and raised Mexico, Missouri. Uh, what was your upbringing like? It was tough. You know, it was tough. You know, my mom being a single parent, you know, having three kids, my sister, Toy, my brother, Greg. And, um, you know, she was the, the neighborhood booster. You know, she would go on the road and she would, you know, shoplift and she would come back and sell stuff a half price, you know, in the hood. And that's how we made our living. I, yeah. I was best dressed in the school for yeah. sixth, seventh grade. <laughs> we didn't have no money, but I'm best dressed. Yeah. And, you know, my dad, you know, he was on crack, you know, for, you know, majority of my life. And so um, when he went to prison, um, he got out when I was playing for Orlando in 2000, 2003. And um, we never had a, a great relationship, but we kind of, you know, had a relationship when he got out. And I said, listen, if you get back on drugs, I'm not dealing with you no more. And He's been clean for, I think, 23 years. Really? Yeah, clean, no drink, no drugs. We got a great relationship. Text and call every game. Oh, like, man. Yeah, so, like, it just, it was great, you know. But, like, the upbringing was tough because, you know, in Mexico, you did one dab in a lot of different things. Yeah. And so, um, I got into trouble, into trouble a couple of times. I had to move to Kansas City um, my sophomore year in high school, live with my uncle Kevin Graves, who um, did a good job of just, you know, giving me that father figure and, 
teaching me, you know, discipline and understanding different things because in Mexico, you know, uh, my mom was going out of town two weeks at a time doing what she was doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm staying with my grandma and grandpa and um, they go to bed at 830. I'm sneaking out of the house, you know, doing, you know, (laughs) yeah, going to the gamma spots, doing different stuff, you know, (laughs) six, seven, eight grade. And that's kind of like, you know, Mexico, like, Mexico raises you. It's not really your parents. Mm-hmm. Like Mexico it's, raises you, yeah. the community. Yeah. And so I had a lot of help from a lot of people. So that's why I don't have a problem giving back. Mm-hmm. You, you you mentioned you moved out to Kansas City. Um, I went to school with Jerron and Earl. There was a lot of talent from out that way. Speak to the talent that was in, was it, I don't know, Kansas City, Missouri. I don't yeah, really know. Yeah, it was a lot of talent yeah. coming through. Um, you know, Larry Hughes and Darius Miles and yep. and Jahai White, Lauren Woods on the St. Louis side. Then Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum, yeah, he's a lot younger. But then... Bill. Yeah, Bill. So we had a lot of Missouri talent on the St. Louis side. Then you come to Kansas City, we had Derek Hood, who was mm-hmm. top five players Derek in the Hood, country. Yeah. Um, Earl Watson. Then you had, you know, Jerron Rush, myself. So we had a lot of talent, you know, coming through that through that area. Now you got Michael Porter and... Yep. Um, what's your boy from uh, Toronto? OG Ananobi, like he's from Missouri. So we oh, got yeah. a lot of lot, like a lot of talent from Missouri. But back then, like I said, it was a grind, just trying to, you know, everybody had a vision of getting to this point. And so just had to put the work in. And so mm-hmm. I'm glad I was able to, you know, be one of those people that can, you know, can say I made it. Could you speak to Jerron Rush's talent? Man, listen, he him and Anthony Peeler, I would say was the best. Well, him, Anthony Peeler, and and um, Larry Hughes, as far as talent in high school, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. as far as NBA careers, but um, talent in high school, they were three best players that ever come out of Missouri. And you got a guy who's six seven, can handle, push in transition, shoot, shoot three point shot, post All up, that. guard. Like I mean, he was like one of the best players I ever seen. And um, you know, just and then Kareem come along, mm-hmm. then Brandon came along, but Jerron, like by far, by was far. like it wasn't and his even two close other brothers yet. made the NBA. Yeah. Jerron by far, and that's with all due respect to both the brothers. Oh, Jerron sure, by yeah. far was better that's than both. And they would say that too. You yeah. know, I mean, they would say that too. But he was yeah. by far, he was Cold. the baddest. He was the baddest Cold, dude I've seen. Bro. Yeah, for sure. So good. It was crazy how good he was. Ended up going to Nebraska, Big Twelve school. Played against Paul. Played against Chauncey. Uh, a lot more people. But some of your favorite memories in college. Good football team when you was in school. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, good, great yeah. football team. Tommy Frazier, yeah. uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Phillips. 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 Yeah, Phillips. Lawrence Phillips, Phillips. rest yeah. in peace. Uh-huh. Um, so going to Nebraska, um, some of my favorite, one of my favorite stories is, um, you know, when I got recruited, I wanted to go to Georgia Tech. And so um, cause I, I, I idolized Kenny Anderson a lot growing up. And so I wanted to go to uh, Georgia Tech. But they had Travis Best, who was cold, and then they had Stephon Marbury, who was going. So they didn't even look my way. And so um, we had a game. We played in a slamming jam in, uh, in, in California, jam. <laughs> in L.A. And um, um, I got my first start, you know, in that in that tournament. And it's a coach called Jimmy Williams. He recruited me from Nebraska. But Danny Nee was the head coach. But Jimmy Williams in the stands. And so um, after the first game, I had a good game starting, whatever, played good. And so um, – Shannon Spradlin, who was the coach, like, man, um, there's a team that want to talk to you. They're like, talking about they want to offer you a scholarship, whatever. I was, like, oh, I was excited. What grade, said, no, what, what grade were you at this time? Uh, my junior summer, going into my going senior, senior year. Okay. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, I'm excited. Like, thinking Kansas. I think he said Nebraska. I was like, Nebraska? Like, <laughs> so, I ain't like, going to play football. Yeah, yeah, Nebraska. I'm like, what? He's like, no, he want to talk to you. So Jimmy R. Williams, I give him credit. Like, he stayed on me from day one. And so um, after that AAU situation, um, I didn't pass the ACT test my first time. And so, like, all the schools, like, Kansas started recruiting me, Arkansas, Memphis State, Missouri, and Kansas State. And so I didn't pass my test. And so all the um, schools stopped recruiting me. I'm like, I'm going to pass my test, whatever. So Nebraska said, listen, we'll take you as a Prop 48. Like, if you don't, I said, listen, I'm going to pass the test. He's like, if you don't, we'll take you as a Prop 48. So they stayed the whole way. So then I passed my test. And all the schools try to come back. Oh, we knew you. Were, like, no. Nah. Yeah. So I just stuck with Nebraska because they stuck mm-hmm. with me. And that's kind of the story behind it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's hey, what's up. That's right. You mentioned briefly uh, the football team, but talk about what those experiences were like watching that, those corn huskers out there do what they did. So when I first got there, the football team and the basketball team didn't get along. And so that's almost every college. Yeah, yeah, though. yeah. So I'm but like, if anyone can bridge the gap, yeah. <laughs> it's Steve Lou. Yeah. So, so, um, so we came to Nebraska. They said we had the worst recruiting class ever in the history of Nebraska. So it was me, myself, <laughs> Albert Mitchell up. was from Omaha, Nebraska, Bernard Garner, who was a junior college player of the year, Vincent Hamilton, and um, Larry Florence. 
And so we got like five, six fights with the football players. We got um, suspended. We couldn't even go to study hall. Like they did, we, we, we wasn't allowed to go to study hall because we got kicked out of study hall. So, <laughs> which was good for me. I didn't want to go to seven nine anyway. So that was cool. that was cool with me. But like it's like man, y'all the worst recruiting class ever in the history of Nebraska. And so we just bumped heads. And then like after a while, they're like, man, these dudes are just so they. So then we became close. Then Vincent Hamilton, he roommate, he was roommates with Tavy. Then uh. Kenny Cheatham was one of my not closest friends, Eric Warfield. So, like, then we all became tight, and we was all a crew. And then from that point on, the basketball and the football team got along. It was like, man, we didn't mess with the football I mean, the basketball team, because them guys are the suckers. I'm like, man, what y'all talking about? Jerron Boone and Eric Strickland, Mikey Moore, they never bridged that gap. And so, like, yeah. it took T. Lou, T. Lou to kind of bridge that T. gap. T. Lou could bridge it's the been gap. Cool I'm not since. surprised. <laughs> yeah. They had, some, they had the football teams that during that time, though. 1998 draft, taken 23rd overall to the Nuggets, traded to Los Angeles for Nick Van Exel. Do you ever look back on your career and think like, damn, if I would have just went to, I mean, obviously you went to a great situation, but yeah. what if I would have stayed on this path? Yeah, I do that all the time, you know, but I think God puts you in a position you want you to be in. Yep. And so um, never look back and never have any regrets. And so, but, you know, coming out of college, you know, I average 23 points a game. And then, so you get drafted by Denver, like, okay, I can go there and make get mistakes, off, get, get off, maybe mm-hmm. get paid, you know. And then 10 minutes later, you get tra- you get traded to the Lakers and everything totally changes. Yep. And so, um, you know, in LA, like, you know, you're in practice, you're playing good, you're scoring, me and D Fish going at it. And I never seen the floor. I'm like, I mean, I'm, I'm playing good, I'm balling, but I couldn't get on the floor. So I had to change my mindset, had to change my mentality. And so I try to tell these young guys the same thing. Like, okay, you want to be a scorer, you score, but like, when you come to the NBA, you got to find a, a way to get on the floor. And so I was like, okay, if it's playing defense, picking up full court, mm-hmm. then I'll do it. I never played defense in college, but if it's what I got to do to get on the floor, then that's what I'm going to do. And then Phil Jackson started to trust me a little bit more. Then you get more and more leeway to do more things. And so that's kind of like, I just had that talk with Musa, you know, today, you know, before the game of the day, talking to him, like, you take steps. The NBA is about steps. And so... Um, that was one of the steps I had to take. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of Doc's favorite lines he ever said was be a star in your role. Find out what the role. fuck you need to do and <laughs> run in that lane. Yep. On July 29th, Errol Spence and Bud Crawford will put their undefeated records on the lines. Our partner is DraftKings Sportsbook edition of a can't-miss offer for this fight of the year. New customers can bet just $5 and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Use promo code SMOKE when you sign up with the DraftKings app. Stack, who you going with right now? You know, Crawford is the slight favorite. Yes, this is a 50-50 fight. Uh, both fighters are bringing something different to the fight, and both are at the top of the division. But me being from Texas, I'm going with the big fish. I'm loyal, and, uh, you know, hey, we're going to get him out of here. You heard Stack. Take your pick on over to DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers use the promo code SMOKE. Throw down just $5 and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. If sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry. You can still join in on all the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use the promo code SMOKE. Bet $5 on any wager and get up to $150 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code SMOKE, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Now that it's summer, you might be looking for some wholesome, convenient meals to support sunny, active days. Factors, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with flavorful and nutritious ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track watching your goals. Too busy with summer plans to cook, but you want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, skip the trip to the grocery store. And the chopping, prepping, and the cleaning up too, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factors fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. So all you have to do is heat and enjoy. Then you get back outside and soak up that warm weather. Stick to your wellness goals with premium ready-to-eat meals with high-quality ingredients such as broccolini, leeks, and asparagus. Treat yourself to 34-plus weekly restaurant-quality options like bruschetta shrimp risotto, green goddess chicken, and grilled steakhouse filet mignon ready in just two minutes. Too busy running around during the day to think about lunch? Keep your energy up with lunch to go. Effortless wholesome meals like grain bowls and salad toppers that are ready to eat when you're on the go. No microwave required. Looking for calorie conscious meal options this summer? Try delicious, dietitian approved calorie smart meals with around and less than 550 calories per serving. Need an extra boost to support your wellness goals this summer? Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. We offer delicious, flavorful, packed options on the menu each week. 
to fit a variety of lifestyles from keto to calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and protein plus, prepared by chefs and approved by dietitians. Each meal has all the ingredients you need to feel satisfied all day long while meeting your goals. And if you're looking to mix it up, you can add protein to select vegan plus veggie meals each week. This July, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh flavor packed meals delivered to your door, ready in just two minutes. No prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash smoke and use the code SMOKE50 to get 50% off. That's code SMOKE50 at factormeal.com slash SMOKE50 to get 50% off. Buying tickets can be stressful, from finding them last minute, to hunting down the best price, to competing with other buyers for popular events. Your favorite event shouldn't be stressful. Game time is a fast, easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last minute tickets, the best price is guaranteed. You can stop stressing over tickets and start getting hyped about the fun you'll have. I love browsing through the Game Time app and finding the best summertime concerts and basketball games in LA. Game Time is the place for last minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals for tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The Game Time guarantees you'll always have the best price. If you get tickets in the same section or row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Snag tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app and create an account using the code SMOKE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code SMOKE for 20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. When did you start working out with KG and Chauncey, class 95, Joe, Joe Abenazar? Yeah, uh, Joe Abunazar was... Abunazar? How you say it? Abunazar. Abunazar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm proud of you for even trying. I would have just said Joe. Yeah, yeah. I tried it. You tried it? I tried it. I tried it. I tried it. Me and Chauncey's relationship started uh, when we were 17, playing in Slamming Jam. He played for the Oakland Soldiers. And uh, we played against each other, and we exchanged numbers. We were 17 years old, and we've been best friends since. That's dope. And then Chauncey was, you know, he's top top five players in the country. So he was tight with Steph and Mm -hmm. with KG and Sham and all those guys. And so um, we went to college. We stayed in contact. And when we got drafted, when Chauncey got drafted, we were represented by Andy Miller. So Kevin Garnett had Andy Miller. Then Chauncey had Andy Miller. Stephon had uh, Andy Miller. So that's kind of how we formed that bond. And then so Chauncey introduced me to KG. And then we all three just had that bond, like, you know, forever. And then we started working out with Joe, which started in Bloomington, Indiana. Then we went from there. We went to um, Sarasota, Florida. And then Joe's like, how you think about, you know, what you think about, you know, taking the show to, to Vegas? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let's try it. Joe, and then yeah. I think 2005, 2006, we moved to Vegas, Impact Basketball, and it took off. Yes, Rest guy. is history. Yeah. Is he still Al out here? Joe. He's still out here. Yeah, he's, he's still, still doing it. Hey, yeah. I need a gym. Still doing we got it. practice on Friday night. No, Joe man. got a gym. Oh, I need a gym. Whatever, yeah. Yeah. Joe got anything you need. Anything right you need. Now. Done deal. I need it. Right now. Done I just literally deal. put a message on Instagram yesterday. A bunch of people hitting me up. No, Joe will do it right yeah, now. I need for it. sure. Mm-hmm. Best story you have from those runs. Give me a quick story from those runs. From uh, Impact? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you was there, you was there, Stack. I was there. Yeah, I'm about to tell you, I'm okay. about to tell you the story. So, right. one summer, uh, it was me, Jared Dudley, Alan Anderson, Tayshawn Prince, and uh, Patrick O'Brien. So, for the whole summer, we never lost a series, the whole summer, right? So, y'all came in, you came in with BD, y'all came in, and we never lost a series the whole summer. So, we we played the whole summer, and now we, we five... Middle, middle of the pack players. Now we wasn't no like top, top of the line NBA players. And we didn't lose the whole summer. So they brought you in, brought BD, brought Matt, and we still never lost. Chauncey. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, they brought all the yeah, all the big Antoine Walker, all yeah. the big dogs. They had, yeah, running through they everybody. Had, and we didn't lose. They had summertime <laughs> chemistry. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and we had rotations. We, and, and and double A that summer. Now, hey, hey, this real. Real. He, he, was on one. Right? he can get going. Double A was on fire. Yeah, he was on, on one. fire. And so like they would bring everybody in. So like they, oh, y'all was getting mad. Matt wanted to fight. Stein ready to fight. <laughs> 
fight. And then J.O. J.O. won the fight. Patrick O'Brien because yeah. he bold, like, he picking pop. And then we double teaming. Y'all double teaming in the summertime. It's bulls like he going crazy. I remember that now. Yeah. So that was the funnest. That was the funnest summer ever, ever. I'm never gonna forget it, Jelani. Never. Yeah. yeah. They was cooking. They was cooking. They was cooking. Yeah. They was in there cooking. That's funny. Do you think the current NBA players really work out like that in off season, like y'all did back then? I think they work out. Um, but I don't think they compete. Yeah. You know, it's a difference. It's a difference between doing, between doing individual workouts yes. and, and, hooping. You know, and hooping. Playing basketball. You know, and so we traveled. Man, you go to Houston. Man, they bumping in Houston. We're going to go to Houston. Playing at UCLA. We're going to go to UCLA. Playing in Vegas. We're going to go to Vegas. Like, we wanted the competition. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, so like, we didn't want to work out individually yeah. all day. and At all. Yeah, well, at all. we really didn't work out. We'd lift weights, maybe. Yeah, well, there was yeah. very we, little. We'd shoot. Yeah, shoot. But we would play but basketball. we playing basketball. And, and, and that's, that's the, that's the yeah. competition part of it that mm-hmm. kind of games kind of lost a little uh-huh. bit. You know, just compete. Well, I feel like not only the competition, but I feel like the basketball IQ with this generation is a little bit lower, but the skill level is higher. Skill is yeah, higher. Because yeah. they're doing the individual workouts yeah, the constantly since they were younger but now. Yeah. So the skill level is a lot different, but they just don't bump like they they don't know how to play off the ball. How do you cut? How do you handle the game when you're not in the mitt? You know what I mean? So I feel like some of it is lost because it is so much one-on-one individual workouts. Yeah, there. I agree with that. But it's like I said, the skill level skill levels is oh, astronomical. Like it's these young guys are doing the things they're doing now. It's like, crazy. It's crazy. You know, but me personally, I want to play. <laughs> yeah, I want to bump. You know I said, I said all the time. I played a little something. I played a good, I played with so many uh guys in the NBA, like, and they talk about all the people who talked about. I say, bro, I, I know some hoopers in the league that was better than these guys. They might be in the Hall of Fame, but I know I, I was a hooper. I know hoopers that came along this game that never get the props or the, or the, or the just do that they deserve because they bust a lot of those Hall of Famers ass but every I, night. But you yeah. also see it in the summer because, you know, I, I, you have, a lot of us are role players. Right. So in the summer, I mean, in the season, you're a role player. You let the leash off these motherfuckers <laughs> yeah. in the summertime, right. boy. Right. Ricky Davis is the main yeah. one. <laughs> J.R. Smith. Yeah. yeah. Ricky Davis yeah. is a 40 ball oh, in the summertime. Man. That was the funnest part. Like, like playing in the summertime? What? Because you got to, me as a, you know, as a role player, you got to play a role every single night. And so that's okay. I'm fine with that. But in the summertime, Cut loose. I'm going after it. You that know what I'm saying? So, and, then, yeah. and then as soon as we're done that's with that, we off. finding the bitches. Yeah. Where the yep. bitches? Yeah, where they at? Right after the room. I'm going to see them. Did you, did you uh, rock with the UCLA runs? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's why I met Matt and Jelani, yeah. BD, Earl. Yeah. Yeah. They were still in college. Yeah. 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 So they were coming. They would play. And um, they used I, to call T. Lou. I'm not talking about bass, but T. Hef. They, I mean, come on, man. Yeah. Come, come on, man. man. You know, that I know was that. that. You know, I know Lou that. Hef, that's over, man. Lou Hef. I'm coaching now. We would see it back in the day. This is why I ain't bringing it up. That's why I ain't saying it. Yeah. No, but I was saying that T. Lou would be active on the court. And then if you wanted something to do, just hit them up. They would find something if y'all wanted to do something. Something, yeah. hit them up. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm just gonna put it like this: We ain't gonna get in that. Just know he a legend. <laughs> <laughs> He's a legend. <laughs> yes, sir. He, said he put that to bed. But I mean, UCLA runs was the best runs yeah. ever, man. But my first year with the lockout season, yeah, I walked in the gym. Kim Olajuwon, Scottie Pippen, Kobe, Shaq. Like, man, I, I was in heaven. Yeah, in heaven. You can't beat. And that. I played against my idol, uh, Kenny Anderson. I, I yeah. Man, sh- I was in heaven. Yeah. Tell and you, bro. And then we were dope too because we kept our little UCLA squad. Yeah, together. y'all played so together. We, yeah. That's to me. That's what got us to the pros. Because say what you want about the regular season, but those bumps against people like him and and people he mentioned, like we got to see that every single day, every day in the summertime. Lockout. You come into a lockout, right? That's mm-hmm. your first year because yeah. that was my freshman year of college. What was that like? I mean, obviously, now you're drafted. You're coming into a season. Lockout hits. How do, how do you, I was going to say, how do you, do you have money? How do you make the money stretch? Is there money to stretch? You're in LA, you want to have fun. Like, what was that first lock, lockout part of your first year like? First first of all, um, the first part of it, you're taking out a line of credit. Mm. You know, try to take out a line of credit because you're not knowing when the lockout's going to end. Then the lockout ends, now you find out, okay, I'm making, what was I making? 575 or something like that. Now you get half of that because the lockout hit. You're only playing 50 games. Ooh. And so you're looking like, man, everybody's interest see, oh, on that loan. Interest you took on the loan. Out. Yeah. And, uh, and, and agent that, fees. And, yeah. And that 500 is 250. It's two, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, two, <laughs> it's 300. So, you know, you get drafted. So everybody, about, man, he's rich. He's he uh, on TV. Buddy. Like, no, nah, I'm broke. You know what I'm saying? So just um, that was the biggest thing, like coming to the lockout. Like, man, not having any money. But the first thing I did with my money, I bought my mama, my mama car, bought my grandma car. And my mom never had a car my whole year, my whole life growing up. We never had a car. You know what I'm saying? So I bought her Escalade. You know, she was happy. 
And then I bought my grandma a car. Ooh, the Escalades was fire. Yeah, back in the yeah. Late 90s so too, they was yeah. doing it out there. Yeah, so the Escalades just that's hit. the biggest thing was being broke, and then just having to grind, man. Yeah. Just grind, 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 yeah. and then playing fifty games, and guys complain about back to backs. We played back to back to back. Yeah. We played three games in a row. Yeah, you know, a few times that year, Shaq didn't play it. They didn't complain. <laughs> like yeah. back to back to back, and so it was a grind, man. But the biggest thing from that was just being broke. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Just having to grind and just trying to get through that year. Coming from Mexico, Missouri, and then Nebraska. What was that LA just lifestyle? Palm trees, sand, women, lifestyle. It's just a whole nother. How did you? How, how did? How, how did you guys take that in? Man, me and Doodles um, hit the ground with 21. So me and Doodles first get here, and so um, who took us up under the wing was Eddie Jones. Oh yeah, oh, gee. So Eddie Jones took us up under his wing. He knew how to move. Yeah, yeah. And we went out 27 nights in a row. <laughs> Hey, Matt, 27 <laughs> nights in, did we do this? Two, 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 27, 27 <laughs> nights in a row, Stack, for real. And like, man, that, and that right there, just that just changed who I was as a person. Right. You know, but like, I never, never, drink, yeah, never drank, never smoked, you know right. what I'm saying? But like, just, in there. just open your eyes to a lot of different things, yeah. man. It, it was, it was crazy. And so, you know, a lot of people can't play in LA. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Because it opens your eyes Come to a on, whole man. nother, whole nother lifestyle, <laughs> and it's just different. You know what I'm saying? So, but I had great vets that that kept me straight. B. Shaw, Robert Ory, Horace Grant, Rick Fox. Mm -hmm. You know, D. Fish and Shaq. They took me like, no, nah, we you're not doing this. They mm -hmm. took me under the wing and got me straight. What I'm supposed to do, and that's kind of like what I think is missing in the game today. Yeah, the veterans, the, the, the vets time, are bro. gone, man. Because yeah. even if they're not playing. Yeah, they it's can keep the guys locker in room check. presence yes. off the court, traveling, it's huge. keeping you out of shit, taking you out twenty seven straight nights. Bro, it's just bro, shit bro. you don't get. You don't want to do that, bro. You trust me, you don't want to do that. What's that? You know what I'm saying to give them that game. Oh, oh yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, right. Twenty seven straight nights in the summer. It was summertime yeah. though. It wasn't during the season. Some people do but during yeah, the season. <laughs> but but I'm we just did. saying, like <laughs> we did. The, the vets, are, yeah, the vets are missing, man. Like, Eighty two games. Just be able to teach, you know, just different things, man. And so you know, the young teaching the young. So hopefully we can get together. Real. Uh, first impression of Kobe. Uh, I think you come into his, your rookie year is his third year. Yeah. He's just starting to kind of come into it. A killer. A killer, man. And um, a guy that never loses confidence. And so, you know, looking at Russ, like he has that same mentality. Like you think of a guy like, oh, Russ, he can't shoot. He can't. Man, Russ. So we, he missed like two or three shots in a row. And Dante Jones like, man, you can't shoot. I said, man, I, I had two scoring titles, man. I got over 25. You think I care about missing a shot? Like, and that's the mentality Kobe yeah, had. Like, yeah. he felt every night he went on the floor, he was the best player in the world. And, um, you know, just, just being to work with him. And so I was hurt. I got hurt my first year, my second year, and Kobe broke his hand. And so mm -hmm. they would go on, team would go on the road trips, go on the road, and we would stay in grind and play one-on-one -on -one every single day. One-on-one, -on -one, full court. He's playing left-handed. Yeah, like, I tell people, and, yeah, yeah. He, he was just a... A killer, man. And every single day, like, you know, he worked out at 5.30 in the morning, first guy to be there, last guy to leave. And he just wanted to be the best. Like, he wanted to be the greatest of all time. And so um, Larry Drew would tell a story about Kobe. Um, we played Minnesota. And um, after the – no, no, I'm sorry. I wasn't there yet. They played Minnesota. And after the Minnesota game, Kobe was in the locker room, and he was just sitting there just smiling. And Larry Drew was like, man, what, what you smiling about? He said, man – I had this game circled on my calendar since the beginning of the season. He was like, what game? He said, man, we play Chicago tomorrow, back to back. And, and Larry, you said, young fella, be careful what you ask for now. <laughs> you, you, playing against, you playing against black Jesus, now yeah. be careful what you ask for. He said, no, nah, but I had this date circled on my calendar. And that's just how he thought. You know what I'm saying? 20 years old, 19, 20 years old, and that's how you're thinking you want to play against Michael Jordan. Yeah. You circle Michael Jordan on your calendar? Mm. And that's just the mindset that he had, man. He had a kill list in yeah. high school. <laughs> Did he? All the top players in our class. Marking them off as he played them. <laughs> Kill list. Jermaine O'Neal, Richard, uh, Rip Hamilton. I wasn't on there because I wasn't. Tim I wasn't, Thomas. He had all them on there though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's who he was, man. Every single day, like in practice, shooting drills, sprints, condition, everything. That's he wanted to win every single thing, and that's that's why it was a great. Great. Uh, your second year, is it second year? Phil comes. Yeah, second year. Uh, first impressions of Phil. Um. I mean, I don't even know how to put it into words. Like, cause really you in awe. Like mm -hmm. you coach Michael Jordan, somebody you grew up idolizing mm -hmm. and loving. And then just the his presence. Like when he walks into a room, 
like his presence is really? is is mm-hmm. like it's it's like with none his, other with his limp and everything. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so the thing that I learned from Phil, which was the best, is he coached in practice. He coached hard in practice, but in the games, he let you figure it out. Like he's not jumping up, yes. cussing, going crazy. Cause it's hard to play as a player, especially as a role player. Like if you make a mistake, you gotta look back and they cussing that coach, coach is going crazy. Mm-hmm. You play on eggshells, but he lets you figure it out. And so I respect that about Phil, just his presence. And when he came in, he had instant credibility. And that's what Kobe and Shaq needed. Yep. Like he held those two guys accountable. I'm gonna hold my best two players accountable every single day. Like me, Fish, and all everybody got to buy in. Yeah, he didn't care about like, he didn't care about us. Every day film session. The first 15 clips is Kobe and Shaq yeah. of how they got to be better yeah. every single day. And shit, we all had to fall in line after that. Like, you're going to be on Kobe and Shaq. Yep. You ain't got no problem for uh, from us, you know? Yeah. So what was the, you know, obviously Phil got there and kind of wrangled them the best he could, to, you know, for your guys' greater success. But what, what, what did you see being in the locker room day to day, all the shit you, what did you kind of see maybe the disconnect being between those two? Was it Shaq? Obviously, his team and he's this, and then he sees this young fella coming up. Or what did you kind of see between those two? Um, I think both of them just wanted to be the best. I mean, I don't think, you know, you know, Shaq said today, like Kobe was, he's gonna be Kobe. Like you wasn't no holding him back. You know, the two air balls in Utah, whatever, that ain't nothing. Like he was gonna be great. And Shaq saw and he saw that. Um, and I think the biggest thing, they both just wanted to win at a high level. And they thought Shaq thought posting the basketball. Every single time was going to get it done. Kobe thought me on the wing, isolate was going to get it done. But they came to common grounds and understand, like, listen, if we put it together, we mm, can win. Mm. They did it. They did it. Absolutely. Was, you know, and I was there, and um, B. Shaw, and like I said, B. Shaw and Robert Ory had a big a big role on that, you know, just bringing those two together. But just being able to, to do it together, after we won that first championship, then it was over. They was like, it was like this. That's you know, you sauce. see Kobe run, jumping Shaq's arms, he grabbed, like, mm, yeah. and it was over. Once they won and seen, like, the blueprint of how we can win, it was over from there. Mm. 2000 finals versus the Pacers. Uh, we're seeing Kobe turn into a star in front of our eyes. Jaden Rose spoke to this about that series. It's a new part of our show. We ain't never did this shit before. Kobe's <laughs> coming out party. When he hit us with the get down, lay down, mm-hmm. that was dope. Because he was arguing with their bench. Like, I used to hear Phil yelling at Kobe. Pass the ball, <laughs> move the ball. <laughs> Get off of it! <laughs> we like, yeah, yeah, get off of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what game he watching. Right, you know no what I'm saying? Right? And Shaq fouled out. Hey man, Cole, I love Cole so much. He went to work on us. Oh. And then he hit that jumper at the top of the key and he did this. That wasn't even to us. That was to his team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he didn't even believe it. No, real talk. Like, calm down. I got this. When yeah. Cole first got drafted to the, I probably shouldn't say, I'm going to try yeah, not to say too much of what I know, but like, like Cole was him? resented by his own teammates. Like, what what he, said that, no, he said that, though. He said that on our show. By they his went, own teammates. I couldn't believe it. They was hating on him. I'm like, why y'all going to hate on him? Because he was that confident. But he ain't even, like, go out. He ain't dream. He was over at UCLA he with us. Lo- we yes. was in college. He was a Laker all on our campus chilling. When you hear stuff like Miss that, you, taking you back to those times, what comes to your mind? <laughs> Man, just a killer. Just like uh, we talked about it. Just, um, you know, Shaq fouled out. So, like, everybody kind of panicked. So they thought, like, okay, Shaq fouled out. We got to move the ball. We got to get everybody involved. We got to play a different style of basketball. And so I think COVID missed, like, Three shots in a row, he like took a couple bad shots, whatever, and he missed three shots in a row. So guys like, man, you gotta move the ball. And then Phil was on him a little bit in the timeout. And then he came out, I think he might have scored like 12 straight or something. And then he hit that big shot and he was like, I got this man, shit. Relax, <laughs> relax. Like, I got this. <laughs> and after that, after that series, then that's when he You see the change. He took off. It was over. Yeah, it was mm. over. Man, relax. I got it. And so, you know, the reporter asked Kobe, he's like, you know, your teammates say you don't trust them, you don't do. He said, well, how you feel about that? He said, well, I feel like I got a better chance of making a shot over two people than the guy that's wide open. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? So you gotta, but dead ass serious, dead though. Serious, dead ass serious, 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 bro. You know, so, you know, I love him. I, you know, right? listen, listen, I'm with I that. love him. That's so hard, bro. I'm with yeah. that. I'm with that. Uh, and he might just make this shit nine out of ten yeah, times. Come on, man. <laughs> 2001, 15-1 in the playoffs. Uh, the infamous step over with Allen Iverson, he spoke to that on our show. Um, and I think surprised a lot of people with his answer. Let's take a look at that. 
You guys run into the Lakers in the 2001 Finals, go into LA, get game one, and you hit the jumper on T. Lou and stepped over him. A meme that still gets played daily. <laughs> Looking back, now almost 20 years ago, what do you think about that? I don't like it. Really? He was giving me so many problems, man. He was a dog. He was, he was harassing me. Straight dog. Mm -hmm. Like when I stepped over him, it was like I ain't know I did it. And then they try to get me to mimic the shit years later. Like I don't even know how to do it. <laughs> you don't know when you're gonna do something. You don't know the emotions in the game or what go on throughout the game. It can be a coach that piss you off and you react a certain way. Just you know to basically tell him, ah ha, yeah, look what I did. That yeah. moment, yeah. yeah, it was it was dope when you look back on it. <laughs> right. But I just don't like it. <laughs> uh, obviously, a moment, we live in a social media moment now. That wasn't back then, but it's still something that kind of surfaces around. Speak to that moment and then also your relationship with him. Um, at the moment, you know, like I said, people make a big deal out of it. Like, he crossed me over and I fell down and then he stepped over me. Like, he, he hit a contested shot and I stepped back and I fell. He stepped over top of me. And... You know, for me, it wasn't even a big deal. Still to this day, it's not a big deal. And you get kids like, oh, that's the guy's option. Man, you weren't even born. Like, right. you weren't even born. <laughs> I'm, on that same, I'm on that same mixtape yeah. where they show that highlight. Yeah. They show me two more, about two more highlights after they falling. So yeah. I'm with you. But it wasn't even a big deal, like, to me. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? People make a big deal out of it. Like, it's a part of history. And that's okay. Like, mm -hmm. I love I love AI. Even before the series, like, it's something I idolize. He's two mm -hmm. years older than me. But, like, man, the cornrows, the from the hood, like, mm -hmm. my height. All the things he did, girls, just like a light, lighter, lighter skin. Light yeah, yeah. That's what they but like, he he changed our game, mm -hmm. like in the culture. Coming up, yeah, the culture of our game, mm -hmm. like the chain. You know, Jordan, they wore in suits. They yeah. like t white tees, to chains, braids. Like he changed the game for us, and from where we come from, that's huge for us. Yes. Because a lot of times, you know, as young black men, we got to compromise. Yeah, I'm not comfortable wearing a suit, and if I get a suit, it might be a two hundred dollars suit. Eddie Jones laughing at me, like, what you got on? You know, he always teasing people. So, like, he changed the culture for us and made it okay to be an NBA player, but also be who you are. Yeah. And so I idolized this dude. I told him from, from day one. And so when I played him every day in practice before we played in the finals, like, just mimicking who he was and um, feel like, play fast, do this. I knew every movie did. Like, I, <laughs> nigga, I was so happy. What? Yeah. Get like, loose. Two weeks of just being, oh, man, Took what? You back to college. Yeah, 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 every huh? move. And so when I played against him in the game, I knew everything he was going to do. Like, yeah. I swear to God, Stack, every every move, every counter. And so, um, you know, to me, like I said, I idolize a dude. And so if it's a moment in history, and he deserves it. Like, mm -hmm. he deserves it. Like, you, I don't I don't make me no You know different. why he say he don't like it? Why's that? Because how he is, the love he have for you. Like, he yeah. don't like how people try to make it as to seem like he belittling you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because the love he got for you, that's why he don't like it. Well, and, and I, I love him. I mean, but, he, I mean, you AI, I'm T. Lou. And yeah. I don't have no problem with that. Like, I'm, I'm a realist. Not but his, his eyes, yeah. you both of y'all here. Yeah, I mean, I'm a dog. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm a, you, oh, you light skin. I'm, like, I'm a, I'm a dog. Like, I'm a guard every night. I'm not going to back down. If we got to scrap, I'm going to scrap. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Goddamn so right. it is what it is. But at the end of the day, like, He's MVP, and I'm just T. Lou. I'm just happy to be able to have a chance to compete against him at a high level. So I'm giving everything I got. But like I said, that's my guy. Like if he needed anything, whatever, that's that's my guy they, to the end. They don't know Chuck is one of the most sensitive NBA players ever. He cry all oh, day. He gonna yes. tell you he love you twenty times. Twenty times. You know what yeah. I'm saying? People don't know random, that about yeah, Chuck. Just a yeah. random phone call out the blue. I it's love him. him. Yeah, that's I it. love you. Yeah, and I love him too. <laughs> What's you know up, bro? What's happening? Yeah. What's happening? You and if I get a chance to compete against him in 2001. I don't know where I would be. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't know. If you don't get mm -hmm. a, that opportunity, yeah, like, I was, like, right. on the bench, kind of. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I didn't play till uh, six minutes ago in the third quarter. I didn't play the whole first half. You know what I'm saying? So, like, having an opportunity to compete against him, like, it just it changed my career. It changed my life. Yeah, you know open what I'm more doors, so, too. Yeah. That 2001 team, one of the greatest, if not the uh, greatest of all time? All time. Yeah, the greatest of all time, for sure. Nobody could beat that team. Who so it was... Name that rope. Who's, who's on that roster with y'all? Derek Fisher, uh, Ron Harper, Brian Shaw, Rick Fox, um, Horace Grant, uh, Shaq, Cole. Uh, was Ori there yet or you came later? Robert Ori. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't, I'm just basing it off of Shaq and Cole. Like, mm -hmm. people talking about, you know, Draymond go crazy. Like, we, yeah, I mean, nah, yeah, they, with Shaq. Nobody, nobody. See, the problem is what they don't understand is Shaq. Like, you know, we can, yeah. you can double team guard Shaq. <laughs> yeah, forget everything. Yeah. Forget everything else. Like, how y'all gonna guard Shaq? Like, that's that's the biggest thing because now 
You in the bonus for six minutes to go in the game. I mean, in the, in the quarter. Now Kobe gets loose. You can't touch him. Can't now he's going to the free throw line. So like, how are you going to guard Shaq? That's what people don't understand. Like, that was, that was the best. That was the greatest team of all time yeah. to me, for sure. Kobe, any Kobe and Shaq team, I don't see how you can how you can beat that team. Shaq, off the court, the biggest kid <laughs> you'll ever meet on the court, a monster. You got to see both sides of him. Um, talk to us just about him as a person and then off the court and on the court. Um, off the court, one of the funnest guys I've ever been around. Cool as shit. The biggest thing with Shaq, like, he he really genuinely cared about people. You know, like, bought Mad Dog a truck, bought me, you know, a whole wardrobe, and bought me a car. When I first met him, I met him at Century Club. He said, come to my house tomorrow. We, I'm, My chef is cooking. Come over to the crib. He gave me 20000 cash. Like, I, I'm in the league. I'm like, Shh, I need, like, you know what I'm saying? Lockout. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just who he is. Like, he's a given person. You know, a genuine guy. And so I, I asked him, when I said, man, Shaq, how you be going out all the time? It's like, the more you go out, the more they see you, the more they won't bother you. Mm. Like, if I'm in the house and I don't ever come out, they wanna, they see you, you see Shaq, you're going to go crazy. But shit, man, Shaq's at the mall. Shaq's at, the, at, at Fat Burger. He's always out. So then it becomes, oh, it's just Shaq. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a smart way to live. Because when you're that big time, you know what I'm saying, it's hard to go out, yeah, you know, right. a lot of times. And so he just kind of made himself, like, amongst the people. He just put himself amongst the people. And it was an easy way for him to live. And it was, it was, it was dope. But um, as a player, like... <laughs> the most dominant guy I've ever seen. Like, I mean, what can you do with him? Like, post up, he can pass, he's agile, put the ball on the floor, passing. And I think, you know, I think when Phil came to the Lakers and kind of gave him some structure, putting that triangle in, I mean, it was over. Like, just having a, 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 some structure. But, like, he's he's the most dominant guy mm. I've ever seen in my life. A lot, of people, a lot of people forget that they was on their way to four, Pete. A lot of people don't even remember that. Yeah. Like, they was going to win four. Yeah. That's crazy. 2001, you signed with the Wizards. What was it like playing with a 40 year old MJ? I didn't care if he was 90. Yeah. You know what I'm <laughs> like, man, come on, man. Like, get a chance to play with, with, with him, man. It was like, it, it was a blessing. You know, like I said, my career has been blessed. Like I said, it just, um, when I first saw him, well, when he first called initially, because he was, he was part of the front office, and I heard his voice, I'm like, man, what? Are you serious? Like, MJ calling me, like, called, and like, we want you to come here with the Wizards, whatever. He said, I'm thinking about coming back, but you know, we, we didn't discuss it. You know, he didn't, didn't go public for a while. But then just when I first met him, just in awe, man, like just having a chance to, you know, see Black Jesus in person, man. like talk to him, be his teammate. Like I was in awe. And my first year playing with him, man, I just didn't, I didn't know what to do. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm throwing to him every time and just go stand. Or yeah. he's like, no, I'll play. Like, but you just get so mesmerized right. by who he is. I'm mm -hmm. about 40. Yeah, he was 40. He averaged 20 points a game at the age of 40 on one leg. Cause his, his knee was messed up, and he and he played eighty two games at the age of forty on one leg, and played all eighty two games. So I mean, I just tell you who he is. You That's know? crazy. <laughs> eighty two games. That's crazy. Two thousand three, you're you're on five teams in five years. What's your most memorable team? Since two thousand three. Yep. After two thousand three. Uh, yeah, yeah two thousand three. Um, I had a chance to play with Dirk and J Kid in Dallas. Um, that was dope. Um, Glad you wasn't in 2007. <laughs> <laughs> Atlanta with Joe Johnson and Al and Twan was good. But I I think I didn't play in 2009, but I think that run that Dwight Howard never had when he went to the finals um, in 2009 against the Lakers, um, that that was a fun year for me. Because it was my last year I didn't play. And I was just along for the ride, mm -hmm. but it was it was it was a great ride. Speak to Dwight though, because people don't understand. I think they currently, and when he went to the Lakers, he hurt his back. That Dwight Howard, because I came the next year. That that Dwight Howard. Yeah, I mean, that Dwight was supposed to be the next Shaq, and he could have been, like I said, if he didn't hurt his back. But dominant defensively, like one of the best defensive players we've ever seen in this yeah. game. Like, um, and then his athletic ability. You know, give me. If, if he gets behind the defense, don't even just go the other way. Like yeah, it's, it's a it's a dunk. It's over. And then when he matured and got better for our ceiling in the paint, ducking in, because oh, Stan was great for him. Stan Van Gundy, yeah. like, we're not gonna throw it to you on the post every single time. Like, we're gonna run our stuff for Charlotte Lewis pick and pop. He don't have now we're going down the gut, and it made the game easy for him. And he was able to understand how easy it is to play the game, you know. And so, but like far as defensively, I've never seen a, a better defensive player in, in my time. You know, have you stacked? I haven't known. Yeah, I mean, nah. block shots, nah. rebound. And so, and nah. then the athletic ability he had, like, far as going upstairs, like, he was dominant, man. And just, you know, unfortunately with injuries, you know, he hurt his back. And 
you know, he wasn't ever like the same player. Still a really good player, you know what I'm saying? But he wasn't the same player and the potential was like what he was supposed to be after he hurt his back. What was the process of you landing the Cavs job? Um, so I was on doc staff in 2013. Mm -hmm. and we was with, uh, with Matt and CP, DeAndre, Blake, uh, JJ and uh, Jamal. Oh, so we had, a, we had a great mm -hmm. team. And um, after that summer, I mean, after that season, it was summertime and I had a chance to interview, head, uh, interview for the head coaching job with Cleveland. And so I flew down to Cleveland, interviewed for the head coaching job. And um, when I left Cleveland, I flew back to Vegas. I could say it was summertime. I flew back to Vegas. And so I thought I had the job. And so David Griffin told me, like, you know, I think it's a good chance you might have a job. And so, you know, we want to prepare you for everything. So I called Doc, like, man, I think I got a good chance of getting a job. And then, you know, a day later, like, you know what, we might go with David Blatt. You know, so I was like, okay. I was kind of bummed about it. But I was like, all right, cool. You know, whatever, I'm going back to the Clippers. And so um, – they hired David Blatt, and then the next day, David Griffin called and was like, hey, we'll make you the associate head coach. And I was like, no, nah, I'm cool. Like, I'm loyal. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes to a fault. And I was like, no, nah, I'm going to stay with Doc. Like, you know, if I'm on a Doc, I'm going to get a head coaching job anyway because he's the most mm – -hmm. you know, he's one of the top two or three coaches in the league. So I'm going to get a head job anyway. And the team that we had was good enough to be on TV every night. I was a defensive coordinator. And so I was going to get an opportunity. So I wasn't really tripping about that. So then he came back and was like, you know, uh, we want to offer you 1.2 million a year, 1.2, 1.3, 1. 1.4. <laughs> I'm getting three. I'm getting 375 with the Clippers. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I'm like, man, that's a lot of money. So I yeah. asked B. Shaw, he's like, man, you gotta take it. I was like, no, nah, man, like I'm loyal to Doc. You know, I talked to Jerry. He's like, what the? Yeah, Jerry was, you know, he, he cussed me out, going, you gotta take. It. I was like, nah, I'm gonna stay with Doc, man. I ain't gonna take this job. He's like, man, if you don't leave Doc now, they're gonna think you're never gonna be able to leave, and they'll never offer you a job. Like I was like. I'm not gonna do it. And so my agent said, you sure? I'm like, I'm sure. So he called Griff back, like, no, he's not gonna do it. He said, well, what's he wanna do? I was like, um, I just don't wanna do it. So he came back with another offer. I was like, nah, I ain't taking it. He said, well, what's he want? I said, man, just tell him one six, one eight, two million, two two. My agent called back and said, done. I said, what? What? <laughs> what? I, just, I just threw it out there, I'm like, what? He's like, they said yes. And so I called Doc back. And Doc was like, you know what, Ty, like, gotcha. for that kind of money, you got to. And mm -hmm. like, yeah, I think it's time for you to kind of Expand your wings and just kind of do your own thing and let people know that you can stand on your own. What year was this? That was 2014, 13, 13 14. 13, 13, 14. Yeah. So you 14. were there when I came for that short little time? Your, 10 days? You were 10 well, days. Yeah, but I, I, for the Clippers, I was there for two weeks. No, I was gone. No, you was gone. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, gone. Was gone yeah. already. Okay. Yeah. And so yeah. he's like, you got to you got to take that job. And so that's kind of like mm. I went to Cleveland the first time and then and then Coach Black got fired midway through the season. I took over. You made it yeah. happen. Yeah. And what was it like sliding into that for? Because, like you said earlier, like Coach Black didn't do a terrible job. Yeah, <laughs> he did a good job. What was it like sliding over one seat? I think I was, nobody, nobody just didn't know who he was. Like, yeah, it, I was scared. To be honest, I was scared, and um, I never forget. You know, um, David Griffin called me. I was on my way to a dentist appointment. He said, uh, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm on my way to the dentist." He was like, "We had a day off," and he was like, um, "I need you to come into the office." I was like, "Man, I got a dentist appointment." He's like, "Just reschedule to come into the office." So. I came into the office and he was like, um, how are you feeling? I said, I'm feeling good. Like, what's going on? He said, we just, you know, we just fired David. I was like, who the hell is David? <laughs> I'm like, Coach Black. I'm like, who, who's, he's like, Coach Black. I'm like, why? He's like, we want to hire you as the head coach. I was like, man, I can't do it. Like, I was scared. I'm serious. I was scared. <laughs> yeah. Like, you got Bron James, you got Kyrie, K-Love, the expectations. And um, so I was like, so I called Doc first. I was like, man, I got to call Doc. I called Doc. And Doc said, Ty, you got to take it. Like, got to. You know, black coaches don't get the opportunity to have mm. a, a championship caliber team. He Off said, the rip. Yeah, he said, you ready? I said, Doc, I don't know if I'm ready. Like, I mean, I put all the work in, but I've never sit there before. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? I never sat there before. And he was like, you got to take the job. Like, you got to. And I was like, man. So then I called Jerry West. He went, you mother, you what the, you know, he going crazy. <laughs> yeah, he going, you know, you got to take the job. You know, if you don't, somebody else is going to take it. So I like, I took the job. And um, like I said, I was scared. I was nervous. You know, because I didn't know, like, we haven't had a training camp. It's not my team. It's not my play. Like, well, we put in a lot of our stuff because, you know, the second year we had to put more conventional NBA sets in instead of overseas stuff. But it was just, I was scared. And um, I, like I said, I give Kyrie, Braun, and Caleb and Tristan them credit. Like, they, like, man, listen, do your thing. You ready. You're going to make mistakes. We got your back 100%. And that's what made my job a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, shout out to those guys, you know, Shump and JR and Tristan and all those guys. They really had my back. And so, 
I was able to make mistakes and kind of like learn on the fly, and it made it easier for me. Mm. Uh, play with Kobe, play with Mike, coaching LeBron. What was that like? I'm the only one. Blessed again. Like to you know, um, play with Kobe and and Jordan, and then and then um, I mean, you play coach, with, against LeBron too. But. Yeah, yeah, but like to be in the conversation with all three of those guys, and I've been affiliated with all three of those guys. It's just a blessing. You know, um, three of our greats, greatest of all time. Yeah, to be the three to, greats of all yeah, time in my mind. Yeah, all time, and to be able to be a, a part of their lives and then be a part of my lives, and I can call Michael Jordan. He can mm, call me. Crazy, and you know what I'm saying? Like it's just like Bron. You know, talked to him earlier today. Like mm -hmm. that's just crazy to me, being from Mexico, Missouri, and just going through what you go through, and not really having nobody to look up to in those small towns because you don't. We didn't have nobody to look up to. Nice. We looked up to. Some guys we weren't supposed to look up to, yeah, you know what I mean? Boys, yeah. And so, um, you know, it's just it's a blessing, man. Like I think about it all the time, like where I come from and who I've been able to be affiliated affiliated with over the course of my career has been a blessing. Mm -hmm. 2016 finals against the Warriors, one of your defining moments as a young coach, obviously. Uh, take us back to that locker room down three one. You didn't do the typical shit that coaches do. Walk us through that uh, that moment. Because uh, it's it funny, we just had Shump on here, and, and Shump told us what Bron said on the bus to kind of get them going, and then you added your part to it. Are you talking about game seven, or are you just talking about just, just in general, the, the just, whole, yeah, the whole thing? Yeah, just the process. Yeah, so we we got down 3-1, and um, I just felt we can beat them. Like, I, if some things we had to adjust and make some, make some adjustments and some tweaks, but I just felt we can beat them. I swear I did. We got down 3-1, and I was like, man, so I called Bron into the office and said, listen, we got to do this, this, and this. And we can beat the – and Braun was on board. like, man, they're getting tired. They're getting worn down. But some things we had to change defensively to, to kind of change that. And so I came into practice uh, before a game – before we leave, before we left to go to game five. I was like, listen, if you don't believe we can win, just stay here. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm being – like, no bulls. Like, just stay here. Like, we don't want you on the bus. We don't want no negativity. If you don't think we can win game five, just stay at home. We'll see you for game six. So we go there for game five, and um, we win game five. And so Kyrie had 41, Bron had 43, whatever. And um, so after the game, everybody's in the locker room, all the coaches, the front office people, the owners, their kids, training staff. So I said, everybody in the locker room, give me $200. It's like, what? give me $200, players, everybody. And I'm going to take it and I'm putting it in the ceiling. And we come back to get our money for game seven. So that means we had to go home and win game six okay, and then yeah. come back for game seven. And so... It's like, what's it, man? Everybody. So everybody gave me the money, took it, wrapped it up, put it in the ceiling. We go home, win game six. So we're coming back. Bron gives a speech. And it's like, listen, they're getting worn out. They're getting tired. They're getting, like, we just got to keep going, keep going. So we get back for game seven. And, um, you know, Bron was, you know, Bron is, he can get 20 and 10 in the first, in one half, just like rolling out of bed. Right. So, but in the first half, he was like, he was just, he wasn't doing enough for me. You know what I'm saying? So, he come to the bench one time. He's like sitting on the bench and he's sitting with legs crossed. He's like five hundred nails. And so I'm like, man, D. Jones like, no, not right now. Not. I'm sorry. So D. Jones like, not right now. And T. I'm like, man, this dude, he blow, he buzzing me. Like, what's he doing? So then halftime comes and we go into the locker room. And so at halftime, we, you know, they got the film and all the film. I was like, no, nah, we ain't doing no film. I said, Brian, you got to be better, bro. He's like, what you, what you mean? I, I got this. I said, I don't care about no stats. You got to be. He said, what, what you want me to do, T. Lou? Guard Draymond, be aggressive, shoot the ball, stop turning the ball over. Anything else? He's like, man, I said, man, we need you to be better if you want to win. It's, it's on you. And he's like, so I stormed off. I go in the locker room, slam the door, boom. So we go grab D. Jones. D. Jones, man, with your boy tripping, man. He's like, D. Jones, like, who? He's like, man, T. Lou, he talking about I ain't doing this and doing that. He's like, well, man, listen, I ain't been here all year, but everything I read is about how you trust him and how you... But why not trust you now? So Brian like, fuck you. So he go to James Jones. <laughs> JJ, I can't believe, man. T and then James Jones like, Yo, James ain't. Well, Brian, is he lying? Fuck you. So he, he grabbed it. Boom, he stormed out of the locker room in the second half, dominated the whole game. <laughs> and so he's like, man, if you didn't get that speech at halftime, we wouldn't have uh, won. Yeah, like, you know yeah, what I'm saying? So bro. like, man, Brian, man. You knew how to trigger him. Yeah, I knew how to get him going. Like, he can, man, he can, listen, bro. Like, he can score 50 anytime he wants. Like, yeah. I'm saying, like 50. Anytime he wants. Like, he just wants to play the game the right way. But sometimes, man, the right way is, man, we need get you to get 50. Yeah, we you need know you. What Don't like, get 50. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. so he can do that every night. And so I push that button. And so 
Luckily, I did. And so that's dope. I never heard that story. You never heard that story? Nah. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. dope. Yeah. That's dope. So I've heard I ch- the first part. I haven't heard him kind of going so, some of the stamp when he was he was yeah, wrong he went, and no one was stamping it. Yeah, he went to DJ on. DJ was like, man, listen, everything I heard, like, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Don't bring me in this shit. JJ, I can't believe it. JJ said, well, is he lying, man? Ain't no JJ a real yeah. one. JJ a real one. He had his stuff. He stormed out of there and, and killed and, it. And killed it. That's you know dope. what I'm saying? So I'm glad I did that. Thanks, Bron. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Taking us back to that Kyrie shot. Uh, talk to us about that shot. That's something that Clay said one of the biggest regrets of his life was switching that play. Uh, you know, you have Bron, you have Kyrie, and ends up in Kyrie's hands. Walk us back through that process. Um, so you remember Bron had just made that big block, and he was exhausted. Like, he hadn't came out of the game the whole game. And so he was he was done. He was fried. And so uh, we came to the bench. I think it was a minute and 13 left in the game, something like that. And um, we came back to the bench, and man, Bron's over there. He got the wet towel. He's just, so I'm looking like, shit. I'm going to Kyrie. I, ain't, you know, what I'm saying like he's exhausted. So we come out of timeout and we just run a twelve action with Jr. and and um and Kyrie. And we cleared the whole uh, right side out and said, Jr., you got to set us a, a hard screen, make him. And Kyrie, you got to fly off to force the switch. Jr. set a great screen, and then Kyrie came off. So I ain't gonna take the three. I thought I was gonna go to the right. You know what I'm saying? Kyrie sized him up, <laughs> step back to the right. That's one of the biggest shots in NBA history. I said, I don't care who was guarding him. It could have been anybody. That shit was cash. Cash. And, and, and Kyrie is <laughs> for those moments. Like, you know, he's a killer. And who's his mentor? Kobe. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like, exactly. And so, like, he, he wanted that moment. That's one of the biggest shots, like I said, in NBA history. Speak to Kyrie. You've got to play with a lot of greats. You coach some greats. I think he's someone who's very misunderstood. But speak to him as a, as a person and a player. Well, as a person, you know, Kyrie's a genuine person. You know, like if you get to know him and, you know, you know who he is, he's genuine. And so, um, like a lot of guys, you just got to be straightforward, direct with him. You know, just tell him what you want, what you need, and he's going to listen and, and, and do that. And so, um, sometimes you misunderstood, you know, oh, Kyrie this, Kyrie that. I don't listen to none of that nonsense. And so, um, I know the relationship that we had, which we had a great relationship. Um, and if it, was, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. Mm. Like that big shot, man, that that's mm. that solidified my career as a, as a coach, winning the championship. And so I always, you know, forever love him for that. But as a player, no weaknesses. Man, no go holes. left, go right, pull up three going right, pull up three going left, catch and shoot, post up, finish left, finish right, float, whatever you want, he can do it. Like no weaknesses offensively at all. And so... I mean, he, he's a bad dude, man. A, a bad dude. And so this year, uh, you're, you're, you're joining uh, Coach Kerr uh, staff for the FIBA Cup. Can you speak to us about that? Man, just a blessing. You know, I always want to be part of a USA team. Of course, you want to be a player, but I wasn't good enough, yeah. you know, of course. But you grew up, you know, watching, you know, Magic and, and, and Bird and all those guys playing the Olympics and the Dream Teams. And you always dreamed of, you know, being there one day. And so my opportunity is coming in coaching. So I... I thank Sean Ford and Steve Kerr for giving me this opportunity to be an assistant coach. So it's me, Steve Kerr, Eric Spolstra, Mark Few. And so just having an opportunity to be, you know, on this staff is a blessing, man. Get a medal. Yeah, and get a gold medal and add that to my resume as well, you know. So um, blessing, it's, 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 it's crazy, man. Good things it's happen cra- to good people, uh, T, and you're one of them people, it. dog. you one of them people, stack. bro. Definitely. Um, I don't know if you've done it yet, but it'll probably come at some point. You and Steve Kerr sitting down and having a glass. Oh, you don't drink. So you having some water, <laughs> him having some wine, and, and, and talk about that 16th no, final. Steve going to roll one probably. You know, Steve. <laughs> Steve said, you know, Steve, you know, his back was hurting, took a little bit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, you know what? It's never, we, and we're good friends, and mm-hmm. we, we never talked about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we never mentioned it. I don't even want, yeah. I wonder if he ever brings it up, That's you know, funny. but we've never talked about it. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, you think about historical significance. Obviously, that was your guys' first ring, but they had the best record in the history of the game yeah. and would have got a championship on top of it, but y'all derailed that. Yeah. That's- I won a championship with Steve Kerr, small world. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Antonio. Um, can you compare, it doesn't have to be necessarily games, but can you compare the Kyrie and LeBron duo to Shaq and Kobe in any ways? Yeah, I mean, you can because I see – as Kyrie is like Kobe. It's like a finesse player that can get it done from anywhere on the floor. And I've see Shaq and Kobe as, as just dominant. Yep. Like just Shaq dominant for yeah, uh-huh. just dominant forces. So the uh-huh. comparison, even though LeBron doesn't play center, but uh-huh. he's dominant, uh-huh. powerful, strong. Um so you can kind of have that comparison. And I wish we would have never broke that up, man. Like that that 20 that, year dominant. Come on, though. man. Like 
breaking up Kobe and Shaq, I hate it. And then breaking up Kyrie Braun, I hate it. Like, those are two things that could have been dominant for a long time. Um, so, um, you know, I always look back on on everybody else because I, I like what everybody else does. I don't really care about myself. But those are two things I wish would have never happened with the Kyrie yeah. Braun situation and, and the Shaq and Kobe situation because – um, that could have been there was more very, juice very special. To, there was a lot more juice to squeeze. More so for me, Kyrie and Braun, because I could see that. I could see that. I was competing with yeah. Kobe, you know what I'm saying? To, I could watch them two just for yeah. years when, you know what I'm saying, championships. I would have loved to see that. Mm-hmm. Why? Uh, what's your opinion? Why do you think Kyrie hasn't found a true home since Cleveland? Um, Hopefully Dallas will be it. Well, I mean, it's his choice. Like, Boston wanted him back. You know, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a decision he wanted to make and, and go elsewhere. And the um, same thing with Brooklyn. He could have went back to Brooklyn. And so, like, as a player, you got to do what's best for you. And so I think those teams, you know, would love, they love, they wanted him back, you know. And so it's just something he wanted to do for his career. Like, he wanted to move on and experience something different. And so, you know, he could have he could have stayed in those places. So I don't yeah. think it's something necessarily that they didn't want him back. Right. You know, so more of his decision. It's more of his decision, yeah. I love superstar movement in the game, though. Normally, guys like us move. Yeah, but I love superstar movement because it's just it, it keeps you you tuned into the game year round. But then you just get to see different combinations play with each other, which you might never obviously have seen maybe back in the day. Yeah, you know? I don't thoughts ask, on the in season tournament. Jack hates questions. the idea. Thoughts Hate on the that shit. Thoughts um, on the in season tournament. I really don't know much about it. You know, I was on a, you know in the meet with the competition committee, and we talked about it a little bit. But you know, my thing is whatever is best to grow the league and grow the NBA. And, um, you know, Adam Silver has a great vision, you know. Of what oh, you we already want. got you motherfuckers know, low managing. <laughs> you want to put them in tournaments now? <laughs> Come on now, t It's not more games, though. It's not it's, more games. You're right, you're yeah, right. You still right. got to play those games anyway. Right. And I just think, you know, it gives the fans something to see, something different, something to be excited about. In Vegas, and, though? Well, the championships in yeah. Vegas. Yeah, I don't mind that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind that. But like I said, Adam Silver's done a great job of growing the NBA, man. Like the play-in tournament yeah. uh, is is going to be, we'll see. But I think it'll be great. And just like the, you know, making it to the playoffs, you know, just having, you know, 10 teams. Like that's been great, I you know. You. So I like that. Um, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what happens. What coaches do you like to coach against? Any coaches, like you just get up for like you love any of your homeboys that coach, like, oh, yeah, I'm I get to get at him tonight. Yeah, I love coaching against Chauncey. Yeah, 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 yeah I, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. You know, but Chauncey changed a lot. You know, from you know player, he was a asshole. You know, yeah. getting all the technical fouls, and now he got a good you know calm demeanor on the sideline. Super calm. Yeah, and just seeing him do it is funny, man. Just being calm. I love coaching against Steve Kerr, obviously, and then I love coaching against Brad Stevens when Brad was there. You know, um, Brad was, um, you know. Like he 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 motivated me, you know. Being being in Cleveland, he was in Boston. They was always like the team we had to get past and get to the finals. And so, um, I always loved coaching against him. And I ain't really like coaching against Doc because yeah, that's my mentor. Yeah. It just don't it don't feel right. Like looking down, I'm looking at Doc. Like I just it don't it don't feel right. It don't <laughs> seem right, you know. So, yeah. Real quick, uh, I think it was Chauncey spoke when Chauncey was. I think debating on becoming a coach. Did he come stay with you for like a crash course or? No, so, um, what was that? Um, COVID hit, mm-hmm. and so I went to Denver and stayed with Chauncey okay. for two months. Okay. Yeah, and so he he was trying to get into the front office stuff, okay. and um, but I've been telling myself I was in Cleveland, said, "Man, come and coach. Like you got a lot of yeah, knowledge for these young knowledge. guys, and yep. I mean, you'll be great at it." He's like, "No, nah, I want to do the front office. I want to be a GM, president." And so, like when um, COVID hit, I went to stay with Chauncey for two months, and I brought my board, and I'm working and all this. And she, he dove right into it. He's like, man, I want to try. I was like, all right. So every day we on the on the board, getting better with that. We watching film, breaking down film. He had a basketball court, you know, at his house. And we go on the court, like going through things. And um, that next that next season, he joined my staff, you know, with the Clippers. And he got a job next year, you know, first year he got a job. And so um, he dove right into it, man. He, and he's been great, man. Like his personality, his demeanor is great. And he's going to be a, a great coach. A leader, too. He's a yeah, leader. Yeah, he's a people, leader for sure. People uh, listen when he talks, for sure. Yeah. How tough, how tough can coaching be on your health and mental health? Um, really tough. Yeah. You know, really tough. Because, you know, as a player, you know, you lose a game, like it's, I think it's more collectively. We all lose together. You know, unless you miss a, you know, you miss a game when it's shy, you be mad yourself for a while. But as a coach, when you lose a game, you take it all home every single night. Like, what could I have done different? You know, could I sub better? Could I call different plays? Like, rotations? Like, and so when you lose a game as a coach, it goes home with you every single night. It's hard to sleep. 
Um, and we know but, as players, we could turn it off for a little while at least. Yeah, Y'all yeah. Y'all can't turn it can't off because you're thinking off. about what you could have done, but then also I got to prep for the next team. Yeah, now. and so as a role player, I'm, I'm not, I never had to do media. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I play the game, I make a mistake, and I ain't got to never address the media. So I go home, I can live with it. You I know, sleep as good. a coach, right. I'm out front every single day, you know, every single day, every single night. And so when you lose a game, man, you take it home every single night. And that's that's the hard part. Like, so as far as your mental health, like, you know, you get anxiety because, you know, like you waiting for the next game or what can yeah, I do different? Anxious. Like, yeah, anxious. You lose three or four in a row. Like, we got to get off this slide. So it's a lot that goes into it, man, and people don't understand. So, you know, a lot of people have a lot of, you know, criticism with coaches or about coaches and things like that, but it's a tough job. Oh, it's a tough job. It's tough, a tough man. grind. It's a lot that goes into it, and you got to wear a lot of different hats every single day. Mm-hmm. Give me two players you like watching outside of your team. Kyrie, for sure. Of course, me too. And then I love watching Ja. Oof. Yeah, I love watching Ja. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we got a lot of other greats, you know, of course, but, you know, I love watching Ja. I love watching, you know, Kyrie do his thing. You a boxer fan? Yes. You love boxing. Don't bring it up, please. Yes. No. <laughs> Spence Crawford. Um, I love both of them. You know what I'm saying? A young black, you know, a young black. You can't go wrong. I, before no. you answer, you can't go wrong either way. Well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm going with Bud because he's from Nebraska. Okay, I was about to say that. My yeah, guy, you yeah. Know, but I love, I love Spence too and everything he's brought to the game. And so I really don't want to see them fight because I love both of them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, since they got a final, it's a big payday, it's a big money maker, and everybody Good. wants to see it. So they got to do it for their careers. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, it's going to open so, doors for yeah, better fights. I got I to gotta go with Bud because it's hometown, it's my guy. And yeah. so I'm going to go with Bud. What you, what you got? Where I'm from. <laughs> you know where I'm from. The big okay. fish. Okay. You're not okay. catching me with no fishing rod. <laughs> you better get a harpoon. The big fish. It's not, but I like it because it's, it's the dynamic of both of them at the top. Arrow has, I mean, Bud has, he's a, one of the best counter punches you'll ever see, right? And he can hit with both hands, his speed. He's going to show uh, Arrow a lot of things he's never seen before yeah. as, as far as a boxer right. and as far as getting hit. But Arrow's from the hit Bud with power that he's never thought was possible. Yeah. You know what I'm they, saying? They both are going to take each other to another level. They, they, got, they, they both, they both yeah. bring us something that they've never seen, so right. that's why I want to see yeah. it. But either way you go in this fight, you can't lose because both of them the GOAT. Yeah, both of them great. And we're going to be here. And we're going to be here. And I'm going to be here. What you <laughs> <mean>? <laughs> we going to be here. We're going to be here. Yeah. We, yeah. Gonna be yeah. we all going to be here. <laughs> Jack going to be working. I'm going to be having a couple yes, cocktails. Sir. <laughs> Showtime boxing, Well, T. Lou, man, we really appreciate your time. Before we get you out of here, we're going to have some quick hitters. So first thing to come to mind, besides your Self, three best coaches in the game at in-game adjustments. In-game adjustments? Mm-hmm. Um, Spo. Yes. Go so, ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Spo, Spo cold. Yeah. Spo's oh, great. Um, Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr is great. Yeah. And then, um, let me see. Who are we talking about, Duda? Oh, yeah, Taylor Jenkins. Taylor yeah, I like, Jenkins. I like Taylor Jenkins. Yeah, Memphis. I like Taylor Jenkins a lot, too. Yeah, I like, too, uh, yeah. Mike Malone. I really felt like the Spo and Mike Malone was chess for a yeah. little while. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? In the yeah. finals. Taylor Jenkins, that's a good call. Yeah, Taylor Jenkins. Pop still a goat. Oh, oh, yeah, I mean, come Pop, on. Yeah, yeah, that goes without saying, like mentioned the Beatles, hey, you know I've seen mean? him do yeah. some stuff in games, bro, that I, I mean, never but, thought was possible, yeah, dog. But he don't have the talent like he used to, you know what I'm right, saying? Like, yeah. it's just it's different. But no, Pops, come on. He had the players to do it. Come on, man. He's a GOAT for sure. One album on repeat, no skips. Ooh. Lil Baby. Which one? The last one. The oh, last one. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, Lil Baby. <laughs> Lil yeah. Baby. He said that quick. Yeah, Lil Baby. MJ, Kobe, Bron, Rankham. Nope. <laughs> no, 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 no. Y'all ain't getting that. That's all my partners. I'm staying out of that. I plead the fifth. No. That's okay. all my different, partners. Different. What do you love about Mike? Um, at the age of forty, just his killer instinct. Like he was still a killer, and then. The, the, the biggest thing is like, you know, as a young player, you come out, that's my third, my fourth year, you know? So you think you're working hard until you actually get around somebody that's working mm-hmm. hard. Yeah, for real. You know, and so coming to practice, you get there an hour and a half early, Jordan's already done. Lathered up, done lifted, already done, done his court workout. He's finished, he's done. And I'm just not getting to the gym. And so when you see guys like Kobe and Braun and Jordan and them work, it kind of like, man, I, I ain't really working. You know what I'm saying? I, I thought I was working hard, but I really ain't. And so yeah. like just seeing Jordan work at the age of 40 the way he worked, mm-hmm. Every single day, and to play eighty-two games, that right. just shows you kind of work he put in. What you love about Kobe? The killer, and then just the biggest thing is just like never giving in. Like after the Utah series, 
when he shot the air balls, he could have could have folded. folded. Mm -hmm. And just to see, like from that that moment on, he worked even harder mm -hmm. to get to the point where he was at. And like you know, I, I still cry sometimes thinking about it, looking at old pictures and stuff. Just mm -hmm. you know, knowing we lost a great man, and so to this day I can't stay at the Bohemian in Orlando because that's where I was at when it happened. I can't. I told the team I'm not staying there. So if y'all book us there, you might as well give me another room because I can't do it. And so just seeing him and just how he prepared and how he was able to, you know, keep pushing forward and being one of our greats, man. Like it was, it was, it was amazing. Every, every time I watch the episode I, that we had on with, with the interview with him, I break down. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bron, what you love about Bron? Um, Bron, I just love how he was able to change the game as far as picking where he wanted to go. Like you said, the stars being on the move, having movement, but also being able to take on his team, like with Rich Paul and Maverick Carter, Randy Mims, and just being able to put those guys together, put them in school, put them through classes, and now they're running multi- Real businesses. Real businesses, you know real what I mean? Businesses. And so to put his guys in position to run real businesses, not worrying about what the outside people thought or they're his friends. No, these guys are educated and they know what they're doing, mm -hmm. and Bron showed that. And so for him to be able to change the game, to build the school in, in Ohio, and the things he's done for the game, and for – Everybody, like Kevin Durant being able to have yeah. the boardroom and like just the things he, he's able to, that we've been able to see with Bron and things he's done, you know, as far as the business side of basketball has been phenomenal. Bron created the real entourage. I mean, they, had <laughs> yeah. the show, they had the show on HBO, but Bron created the real, the real entourage. I say that all the time, T. Every basketball player that came around tried that with their homeboys and he the only one to get it right. right. Completely yeah. right. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. he, he the go for that alone. Yeah, for sure. No, Five dinner guests, you. dead or alive. Any five people sit down at the table with you plus five at dinner? Biggie, Pop, for sure. Okay. That's that's it. right to it. Yes. Yeah, what? what? Man, I don't know why yeah. people don't. Y'all don't know that T. Lou is a ghetto baby, <laughs> dog. He might not look like it, don't talk like it, but trust me, bro. He from that. <laughs> uh, President Obama. Okay. Muhammad Ali. Okay. And um, last but not least. I would say Denzel. Nice. Denzel. Way to, round, way to round that off. Yeah. Wrong with that. If you could see one guest on our show, who would it be? But. You have to help us get your answer on the show. You said someone calls you and you talked to him on the phone today. And that Ron person James. Talked, I mean, him, <laughs> MJ. I mean, you flexed on us a little bit. You flexed a little bit talking about. I know these high figures. You know some people. Y'all know him too. Y'all know him too. Nah, I'm fucking, I'm fucking <laughs> with we you. We didn't just talk to him the other day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or today. <laughs> or today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but someone you, you would like to see on the show that you can help us get. Yeah, LeBron James. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Kang. For sure. K-A-N-G. But you know, man, we appreciate you. As Jack nah, said, man, good, nah, appreciate good you, things bro. happen you know to good people, bro. And yeah. I got a chance to meet you when I was 17, 18. You've always been the same way. Never got too big. Now, you can't get big, but you know what I mean? But <laughs> always been, yeah, same but always dude. been mild-mannered, cool, down-to-earth, doodles, same way, man. So really happy of just your, you know, your, your grind, your growth through the league to coaching now. And I'm guaranteed whatever you want to do continue to do or after this you'll succeed in it man so thank you for talk, your time they, they can't talk about the AI shit and say you wasn't a Hall of Fame player but you definitely finna be a Hall of Fame coach my I guy I appreciate mm -hmm. that yes sir thank you. Yes, thank sir. You. yes sir well that's a wrap Tyron Lou, all the smoke you can catch us on Showtime Basketball YouTube and the iHeart platform Black Effects we'll see y'all next week You up for playing outside the lines? What are her directives then? Neutralize the target. You do it quiet, and you do it clean. If your cover is blown, you have to save yourself. Did you hit the target? I'm doing everything different this time. She's your field agent. Do what you think's best.